Hello everyone, TGIF. It's Friday, we made it. July the 11th, I don't know what we made it to, but we made it to something, I guess. Um, yeah, looking forward to a good weekend, uh, wrapping up the day, the works, uh, the, the week's work and everything else that we have to do. Many of us are working on even through the weekend and blessings to you as well. Um, I've got my come and see shirt on again today. One of my favorite shirts, really comfortable advertising the chosen. So I don't mind doing that for them because it is a powerful show. So you haven't seen the chosen by all means, you need to stop what you're doing, get the chosen app and watch season one, which is episodes one through eight. And then you also need to start on season two, which we now have one through five eagerly anticipating Episode six, when is it coming? It's getting to me, man. It's that great. It's the best show on the, well, it's the only show that's ever been um, on the life of Christ per se, but this one is extra, extra special. Just take my word for it. <clears throat> I'm just going to try to wrap up some thoughts from part one the other day um, of when we were talking about the parable uh, of the sower. Basically, when Jesus is explaining that, and we, when part one, we talked, we got through kind of the first part of it where it talks about how the devil, in fact, steals some of the seed that is kind of sown haphazardly, as I put it, along the path. And so if you haven't watched that one, go back and watch that one, because this is part two of that, and it won't make a lot of sense. Although those of you biblically astute folks, you know, you'll, you'll hop right in. But honestly, um, these are crazy Mark Prince thoughts to go along with these thoughts. So that's an extra benefit. I'm not going to charge you for it. I'm kidding. But anyway, so we finished talking about the first part of uh, Matthew 13 now that we've got into verse 18. And we read, of course, the, soul, the, the parable explained through verse uh, 23. And we'll just read it one more time for good measure. It says, hear then the parable of the sower. When me, one hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, hey, I'm not using my glasses. The evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for that, for what was sown on rocky ground, that is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And then when tribulation or persecution comes arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for that was the son among thorns, this is the one who hears the word. But the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, and that's the one we want to be in, in case you didn't guess. This is the one who hears the word and understands the indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case, a hundredfold, in another 60 and then another 30 and I won't give you a lot of backdrop from kind of how I was just briefly setting up uh, what's going on in this in this particular chapter with the unpacking and all the extra commentary that Matthew gives us in verses 1 through uh, 17 to prepare us for this this parable now being explained but I just wanted to say one last thing really about um, you know the 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 soil the, the haphazard seed that is thrown in the soil that it says the devil takes away. That is soil that really, um, there may be, it really never, um, it really never produces really anything. It's in fact stole. And basically, essentially, someone comes along and says, boo, with some kind of ideology or some sort of a, um, a thought process. And basically, uh, it proves to have been really no, no planting of seed at all. So there's that. But the second part of soil that we look at is, is what the scripture tells us is the rocky soil. And it, it basically says it was, it was sown along the path. It was sown on the rocky ground, though. And, and it was known during that time to have been, you know, a layer. And I explained, like I tried my hand at, um, you know, planting some seed and, and clay soil didn't go so good. Well, the same with the rocky soil. There's, you've got to really dig down deep in order for the soil to, to really mature and to really um, germinate and really to take root. But it's on the rocky ground. And these are the ones, he says, so we know what he means. 
is that they hear the word, they receive it with joy, yet they have no root in themselves. We hear the Bible talk a lot about being rooted and built up in the faith. These are people who are not rooted up and built in the faith. And I would say a great deal of people who um, are in and out of uh, the life of the church, in and out of their relationship with the Lord, um, there's no root in themselves. Many of them are really kind of stuck on the, no, no offense to Joel Osteen, but their best life now, and they never really... They never really get anything. They just pick the nuggets they think will help them better in their business life, what have you. Um, but they don't really, they don't really um, ever become, you know, believers in the sense that they can be easily whether the devil steals or not, whether he steals some here or not, is really irrelevant. The fact of the matter is, they don't go any from anywhere from there. Um, they have no root in themselves. They endure for a little while, but tribulation or persecution comes, the word says, on the count of the word, on account of now saying, hey, I believe the word, and they immediately fall away. And so, really, falling away really is the word for apostasy. So, in a sense, it's symbolizing, and again, I, I preached a message called Soul, Soul Problems on the Narrow Pathway, where I really dealt in detail with this particular, well, with this story but from uh, Luke's rendition of it. And so I encourage you to go and watch that on the channel as well. It's about 45 minutes of real um, paying real, real attention to each of these souls and from my own personal experience and also just from what I feel the Lord was showing me. But it really are people who do this, they fall away, they walk away. Temptation comes as a result of now professing to be a Christian somewhat on this narrow path and yet... Um, that tribulation, that persecution that comes uh, upon them as a result of now raising their hand and saying, yeah, I'm with those guys, you know, the Christian guys, the world reacts to it and they say, wow, this is a little bit more than I thought. You know, this is not really what I'm looking for. And so they fall away. Um, the temptation is usual. It's, it's just fool's gold. The world's so full of fool's gold. Man, it's everywhere. We're, we fall for fool's gold every single day of our lives. Somehow, knowing that it didn't satisfy before, but maybe today it will. Mm. You know, it's uh, like doing the same thing and expecting different results. Something called perhaps insanity. But basically, it gets hot in the kitchen. It really gets difficult. And so they walk away. It's sad. We see a lot of people uh, in that state. A lot of people who no longer are on the path. And perhaps have even become those by symbolizing that they apostatize, that they 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 are um, they've made a resolute decision to do that. Um, the next one is talking about the thorny soil, and this is really the majority of the church, which includes you and I, especially in the Western world, especially in America. So we'll listen up just for a few minutes um, of our time together today. It says. This is the, the this is the one that for what was sown among thorns. So this is the thorny soil. This is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As I told you, the Lord's very much into fruit and growing things, and so things that don't grow, Jesus said, um, they were just burnt up and they were not to be used anymore. Um, don't take that in the wrong way. Simply things that, you know, it's like, you know, anything that you have that has to serve some sort of a purpose. If you buy a computer, but the computer doesn't do computing, then you probably need to get a different computer or do something different or fix it maybe. But it says the cares, basically the cares or worries of this, of this temporal life uh, come in. Um, you know, other scriptures, other, um, the synoptic gospels use the deceitfulness of riches and, and a couple of other things. Um, but basically it is those things, the cares of the worries of this temporal life, the, the sense of this constant pressure, which I feel as well. And I know you do of trying to make it whatever the heck that means, trying to make it as if we all of a sudden make something and we have these possessions and then we'll be worry-free. Truly, having some money can can certainly 
um, can certainly um, lighten the load somewhat of things that require a material response to it, but they don't solve anything remotely having to do with the stuff of life. You can have all the money in the world, for instance, uh, other cares, love and marriage, and that won't solve it. it. It won't solve it at all. These are tremendous cares that we have, raising children, hoping that they go on the right path, continuing to worry and fret over them as 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 time goes on, as life goes on. Um, this um, the growing old, you know, I'm almost 57 years old. Um, I, I started really feeling the pains of growing old almost the day I turned 50. I don't know what it is. You know, I have all my friends telling me, hey, Mark, you're only as, you're only as old as you feel. Well, that's a bunch of bull. Come on, guys. Yeah, sure. I can keep, I can keep kicking. I try to get out, get out there and uh, work out a little bit and keep, keep everything from falling and all those things and try to keep my mind intact and alert and, and, and active things in the natural that we have to be concerned about. The problem is we get so preoccupied with uh, these things like losing weight and, 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 and uh, making money and climbing the ladder and doing all these things, which are all things that are not wrong. God wouldn't want you to take the talents that you have and, and waste them. He speaks about that too. But it's the preoccupation, hear me, of those things over the cultivation of the spiritual life and walking with Jesus Christ on the narrow path. Really, it's, it's tantamount to being practical atheists that you hear me talk about a lot. Um, basically, we're basically like everybody else in a sense when we focus all of our time on that. It's this he who dies with the most toys wins. Um, you know, uh, we see the example in the scriptures of the man with that had um, ease and, and great things in life, but he wanted to build even bigger barns. They weren't big enough, so I'll take it easy. And yet he had not considered the most important thing in his life, which is what takes place when this fleshly, earthly life is no more and he's ushered into an eternal existence. I encourage you to believe that. There are a lot of really smart people, by the way, that believe that. Even those that are not yet on the narrow path, but are but are walking towards it, and who are reconciled because science and and um, of course uh, the faith that we speak of are being uh, more in agreement with one another than perhaps they they ever have as we learn more. Wow, isn't that a shocker? Huh? Something to think of. But actually, the real passage and I won't I won't turn there today but first Timothy 6 talks about not being conceited or fixing our hope on the uncertainty of riches on the things of this world this is where the majority of the church resides this is where we live we can't seem to get past it we're constantly um, asking about the victorious Christian life, how we can how we can get over these things, how we can conquer our flesh. And sure, these are very real things. Romans 7 tells us this. Paul tells us these things. But because of being stuck in the middle of these things and never settling and putting them in their proper perspective, which is, yes, there are fleshly things that that feel good, that are important, and that are not necessarily wrong or bad that we can participate in. There are um, gifts of wealth that the Bible teaches. He is the one who gives us the ability to make wealth, and that's worthy of note. And that there are people who have that gift who can do it in a way and can make lots of wealth, but their priority then becomes, as 1 Timothy 6 tells us, the, the, the priorities of the kingdom. It doesn't mean they can't buy a nice car, a nice house, or any of these things. It simply means that the primary focus now of them now being blessed with that gift of wealth is, is to be able to focus on the kingdom and its priorities. We never really bear fruit. I know many of you at the sound of my voice today, you've probably been in churches, you know, where you, you see these people and you go into a church service and you see them and you realize that these people are very much they seem to be pretty much practical atheists, just like everybody else. They have some, they have a little bit of religion. They have some nice moral practices that they, that they, they, um, they put in their life. But at the end of the day, the real 
pressing things of Jesus telling us to walk on the narrow path, we never, never really give them consideration. And so people who are lost come in and say, well, this is kind of nice. I mean, I went in there and there's some good things going on, but do these guys really believe what this guy up here is preaching and talking about? Do they believe it? How's it affected their life? The vast majority of us reside right here. We prove at the end of the day that we're unfruitful. The last scripture, and we'll close with this, as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, which has a lot to do with um, the spirit opening up our hearts so that we can understand, but also our contemplation longing hard on what the Lord is saying to us and seeking to understand what he is saying in his word, what he is saying to us, the Holy Spirit, and what more importantly he wants from us. And then as a result, he indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case, a hundredfold, in another 60, and in another 30. It's called the narrow path for a reason. I didn't make it up as the name of my blog or the name of this um, YouTube channel to be cute, but because the Lord says that the narrow path is the one that few find and the broad way, the broad path is the one that leads to destruction that seems like everybody, including people in these first three souls, seem to make it in. Now, I'm not saying that the people in the thorny soil um, that are being constantly um, eat up with the cares of the world and deceitfulness of riches are not Christians. Really, only they know that and the Spirit knows that. You may know it if you had a good discernment. But it really is something that we should be mindful of. Could it possibly be that you and I, because we never spend as much time and effort trying to get all that the Lord wants to put into us, that we never really experience the size of the victorious Christian life that we read about because we never just decided sink or swim that we were going to stick on the path. I call it Dory theology. Those of you who saw the movie Finding Nemo, it's not meant to be cute. Her best phrase, just keep swimming, just keep swimming, just keep swimming. My encouragement to you today is if you've taken uh, and put your foot on the narrow path, that you just keep swimming, that you stay that you learn all that you can, that you hear, that you listen, that you pray, and you ask the Lord, no matter what, that you're his. And in time, you'll be somebody who bears fruit. And the Lord really likes fruit. I'm going to close with that today. We'll get into our next uh, parable in uh, beginning of verse 24 in the next day or two. Remember the narrow path, live and in color, this video when you get it. Just like, hit the subscribe button, hit all and the little bell. These will come to you. If this is something that really benefits your life, that you feel like, hey man, maybe I don't always have the time, but th this is a way for me to make the time to kind of get a little nugget from God's word from a knucklehead and maybe can learn something. And if it really benefits you, those who maybe don't know the Lord, but you're saying, well, hey, maybe maybe this guy's got a different way of, of talking about it that can really help me. Maybe... He seems a little more real, a little more down to earth, a little in touch with his own struggle and sinfulness. Then I hope you'll stick with me, um, you know, on this narrow path. And then also the narrow path um, is the name of my blog, and it's markneilprince.com. Uh, it's the narrow path, the daily meanderings of a cracked up American life searching for the Jesus missing in America. There's a lot in that long subtitle. I try to get a blog a week on there. I'm about finished with the one for this week. It may be late as into Sunday or Monday before I get it up, but I'll do my best. Keep trying to do that. And at the end of the day, on that, you just go down on your browser to the bottom right and then just click on it and um, you just hit follow and you put your email in and subscribe to that and those will come to you as well. But let's go to the Lord uh, in prayer today as we close. Lord Jesus, Take these words, these, these meditations of my heart, Lord, and that I've shared back out with your people, and may it bless them, may it bear fruit, and may it multiply. In Jesus' name, amen.